2021 marks the 30th anniversary of the premiere of Clarissa Explains It All. Yes, first airing March 23rd, 1991, Clarissa Explains It All would go on to have five seasons and 65 episodes. And to this day, 30 years later, is still beloved by 90s kids everywhere. Here to discuss the show with us today is series creator and writer Mitchell Kriegman. When I started Clarissa, I was 12, just so you know. Yeah, that's why the show resonated with us so much. You, you were a kid writing it. So, to get things started, how did you come up with the show, though? Uh, um, well, you know, um, I was at Nickelodeon, and they didn't have any, like, real sitcoms or any real people there. And uh, they had game shows, and, um, you know, they just didn't have real personalities. They didn't have anybody that was, like... Um, emblematic of what the network was meant to be. And I was fortunate to work with uh, Jerry Laborn and Ann Sweeney, who were the executives there. And they, um, they were willing to let me see some of the data that they had on the research of who their audience could be. And I felt like, well, it would have been good to do a boy or a girl but a girl was in a moment that could be really breakout and groundbreaking and would get a lot of attention. So I really designed it uh, to be who is the audience of Nickelodeon at that time. And I also felt there was this other thing, which is that um, people didn't think a girl in those days, it's so flipped around now, could have her own sitcom. Everyone thought, it had to be a boy, otherwise girl, boys won't watch it. And I really felt like, and I still do, that girls and boys really cross over a lot. And they, and that if it's a kid, which is the most important thing, then they empathize with that kid. And so uh, I felt like the whole, the whole stake in the ground goal of the show was <clears throat> that girls and boys would like the show. So it was designed, every aspect of it was designed to appeal to boys as well as girls. Yeah, I mean, I'm proof of this, I guess. Um, yeah, it was one of my favorite shows as a kid, and it's really a testament to the writing that Clarissa could appeal to both boys and girls. To me, first and foremost, she was a kid. Yeah, I wasn't a teen girl who had an annoying little brother that I fought with constantly, but I did have an older sister who I fought with constantly, so it's kind of the same thing. Right. Also, side note, my sister was a bigger fan of the show than I was, so she is for sure watching this, so... Hey, Amanda, sorry if I was a little bit more like Ferguson than you would have liked. Um, yeah, no, she was a super fan. She actually even had the board game, too. Oh, the board game was a huge thing. Yeah, I wrote the board game, crazy as that is. Yeah, I wouldn't know. Um, I wasn't allowed to play it. She took the No Brothers rule a little too seriously. I'm kidding. No, it was a great game. I was like, oh. Oh, don't worry. Um, but no, yeah, I think the show should really be admired for how it broke through the notion of boys not wanting to watch girl-centric shows. And, you know, a large part of that comes down to Clarissa herself. So I think we should pivot into the creation of her, essentially, and casting as well. So you clearly had the idea that you wanted a girl in the lead. What was it like molding her into the final form that we see on screen, which is a balance between smart aleck, rebellious, but sadly good character? And what was the casting of Melissa Joan Hart like? Well, it's an odd, it was actually an odd process. The most important process, and it relates to what the show was, is I wanted the character to be the most contemporary possible, you know, 12 to 14 year old in the moment. And which I think is really super valuable because kids speak in the moment really well. And uh, because that's their time. And, you know, my biggest thing was to get outside the typical casting process that they were doing in those days, not just Nick, but Disney, everybody. They were very much picking up kids who had been trained a lot, who had a very kind of stiff presentation and were kind of generally goody goody. You know what I mean? And I wanted somebody natural and I wanted somebody who could uh, who, who could handle the part, which was actually quite a huge task, as it turned out, um, but who could also uh, be relaxed and and so you know when um Claire, when melissa came in uh, she had just a huge amount of um of lightness 
to how she performed and an ability to say almost anything and be very, um, it lightened up the screen. And so she came in, there was another girl that was really quite quirky and I liked her a lot and would probably like to write a show about her. <laughs> and in some ways she was more Clarissa-like, but she wasn't that kind of lightness, you know, and that kind of um, ability to just roll with anything. And Melissa really was. In fact, she ended up being in every single scene of all the episodes. It's really an extraordinary testament to her. And so, um, yeah, it was great to find somebody who wasn't stiff and wasn't actory, and also uh, had a beautiful quality of her own. As an adult rewatching the show, I really have to say how much I admire the balance you were able to strike between Clarissa and her parents when it came to the motives and actions they had. The old joke is in kids' movies and TV shows, when you're a kid, you side completely with the kids and hate the parents. But when you become an adult, you're like, wow, the kid's a little bastard. I completely agree with the parents. Not with this show, though. I may not agree with Clarissa all the time, but I can still see that her internal kid logic makes sense and understand where she's coming from. Well, maybe not attaching your brother to a weather balloon to get rid of him, but again, from a kid's sense, it at least makes sense. I think a great point is when it comes to her desire to drive. You understand her parents saying, no, you're 14 years old, but you can see her side of it being, I'm only a year and a half away from driving. Does it really make a difference if I start now? She's coming from a very real place, and you can respect that, how it doesn't fall into the pit of appearing to be like a brat. Yeah, it was an opportunity with, to do something that I still, you still don't see very often in TV, where both sides get to argue their case, and they're both reasonable. And you, you, know, you may already know where it's gonna come out because she's the kid and they're the adult and, it, and you need to be 16 to drive and all this other stuff. But you get the full kind of presentation from both sides, you know what I mean? And they're not, you know, the parents aren't dummies, but they're really nice listening to her. And, you know, I wish everybody was so nice with each other as that family is, you know? And um, so I really, I loved that. And I have to say, honestly, the parents were written dumber the first time I wrote them, but Nickelodeon discovered when they tested it that kids really want parents not to be stupid. <laughs> they don't get off on parents being so dumb that they're easy targets. The, the, the parents were really great performers. And so they were, could give as well as they took. And, and they really were able to take lines that were funny and deliver them and lines that were compassionate. So it gave you a chance to have a real back and forth, a real give and take between parents and kids. Yeah, rounding back to the parents, it's a real shame that Janet and Marshall aren't listed as highly as some of the best TV show parents of the 90s. Yeah. I place them up there with the parents in Boy Meets World as being the most competent parents in kids' entertainment probably ever, but the 90s especially. Basically, outside of some goofy moments here and there, they're pretty grounded and realistic. You can tell they're former flower child baby boomers who've transitioned into the parenthood in the mid-90s and just are really trying their best. And again, that's something we didn't see too often with 90s parents, so again, points to them. Now, continuing through the cast, Sam. Now, with the exception of the theme song, I think Sam's ladder entrance and music sting is one of the most iconic takeaways from the show people have. Right. Did the network ever push back on this? Was there any pearl clutching from the censors that it could imply something inappropriate between Clarissa and Sam? Or were there concerns from legal over kids trying to do this with their friends and climbing ladders? Right, 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 right. Oh, it's hilarious. I didn't even think about how dangerous it is to climb a ladder. That didn't even come into a discussion anywhere. Um, you know, nobody ever, listen, they gave me, you know, the network and I had our, you know, normal kind of tussles over stuff. But basically, Nickelodeon gave me free reign to produce create and produce a really original show the way I want to. We had some other bigger issues around certain episodes, but there was no creative restraint, really. They were like her bedroom could be what I planned on, even though their set designer at Nickelodeon in-house was in shock that I wanted to paint black checkered boards on his you know, pink wallpaper. Uh, he ended up being a, a fan of it too. Um, the Ladder and Sam was really a very practical decision 
which was that uh, it's something I'm very fond of and I'm fond of it. I try, you know, I, I love the idea of it anyway, but the show wasn't about sex. It was sort of pre-sexual, we used to say. It wasn't really trying to be, their relationship wasn't sexual, they were friends. She was, you know, it was gen, what they call non-gender bias, you know, now, but at that time we didn't have a word for it. And uh, it actually was a practical thing, which is I wanted them, her bedroom was home base. Like, you know, when there's a game show and there's home base, you know, on like Jeopardy or something like that, her her bedroom was home base for the show. It wasn't like most sitcoms where the home base was a, a living room or a kitchen. You know what I mean? Her bedroom was it. And I didn't want Sam to have to go to the door, ring a doorbell, knock on the door to get in and say, oh, hi, can I go up to, you know, Clarissa's bedroom? I, I just didn't want any of that. I wanted it to be like, oh, I want to see Clarissa. Bam, the ladder's there. I climb up. I'm in, we're having a scene and we never talk about it. We never make a big thing about it. It's never like a weird thing even. So I just loved it and no one ever questioned it, I have to say. That's good. Yeah, it's a thing I've seen people trying to, I guess, retroactively make the show dirty by doing that. It's kind of weird. Um, but no, I love the fact that it's just kind of an innocent thing that's just understood by the parents that they're fine with it. I think the only times they ever acknowledged it come to mind is in the pilot, Marshall sees Sam climb through the kitchen window and says, why does that boy never use the door? And then later in the show, Clarissa and Ferguson are home alone and they think Marshall is an intruder as he's trying to come through the window on the ladder because he locked himself out of the house. So again, all of you internet weirdos out there, stop looking into it so much. You're creepy. Don't do it. So we talked about Clarissa and her parents and Sam. Is there anyone I'm forgetting? All right, Ferg face. Yes, Ferguson was a ton of fun. He's the archetypical annoying little brother that you set the stage perfectly with him maliciously bringing in her training bra to school for show and tell in the pilot. From that moment on, the audience knew who he was and the type of character he was going to be. He's just like little Eddie Haskell with all of his surfy sweet demeanor to the parents, but being a two-faced weasel to everyone else. All of his schemes were great. I love when he tries tricking his parents into buying him a disc man so he can claim to learn Swahili. Then you have him as a huge fan of Dan Quayle, which has aged him so much funnier now, 30 years later, because who the hell remembers Dan Quayle? Right, right. But yeah, Ferguson is a mini Republican, and the show obviously frames him as being a dork for that. So was this kind of a, the times they are changing shot at family ties with Alex P. Keaton, who was a Republican? You know, he was the lead on that show for years and a teen heartthrob and all that. So was that kind of just like, let's flip that around to make him the joke character now? Well, and you know, um, Michael J. Fox wasn't the main character when it started, Family Ties. He became the main character. He was so good. But no, it was definitely, look, I was playing off a lot of tropes from other shows. I mean, there was even a show way older than the audience called Dobie Gillis, where Dobie talked to the camera about his life and loves, you know, that was brilliant. It had uh, the guy that ended up being in Gilligan's Island in it as a beatnik. It's actually worth looking at. And there was Family Ties and there was Leave it to Beaver, you know, and and so there are all these different uh, shows. And I was trying to really pick the things that were most had so many contemporary things. And I really wanted to do sibling rivalry, which as, as banal as that sounds now was a big deal. I mean, you're gonna actually have a brother and sister who say they hate each other. This was a shock. And, uh, and in my family, that wasn't allowed. You couldn't say you hated your brother or you hated your sister, even though clearly they hated you and, and that's how you behaved. And you know, that didn't preclude actually standing by your sister or standing by your brother when the chips are down and all those kinds of things. But um, yeah, no, it was, it was a tribute to all those shows and to find ways, the new mix, the new Rubik's Cube, you know, of a show. Yeah, it's a great dynamic and combination to see a character like Ferguson loving someone who's such a punchline in politics. Now, this was a year before the infamous potato incident, which enshrined Dan Quayle into the political joke we all know him as now, but it's still funny to see him cling to such a random person even then. 
It works extra well when you look at this premiering at the tail end of the H.W. Bush administration and the beginning of the soon-to-be-swept-into-Clinton years to, as an indicator that Ferguson is clearly not in the majority with his peers. Even that I could have a reference like Dan, you know, the references in the show are amazing. I mean, I've watched it sometimes and I've gone, oh my God, I actually put that in there, you know? And Dan Quayle is such a wacky reference for any time and place and that they didn't mind, you know, that a character was talking about Dan Quayle. And, and also he really, in a funny way, he sticks out as much as Clarissa. They're both originals. You know, he's a typical sore thumb kind of, you know, and she's an unusual one. And then the parents are kind of hippies. So it's kind of a, a cool mix of, of sensibilities, you know? That's actually a pretty interesting um, point you bring up because when you look at a lot of Clarissa's likes, especially in the early 90s, they were pretty odd. I think the best example comes from the Picture Day episode in season one. When she's picking out her outfit, it's not something stereotypically cool from a teen from 1991 would wear. She's emulating people like Jackie O, Mao, Gandhi, and Barbara Bush. People that kids were aware of, but I don't think they emulated. The other thing to look at is her bedroom. Yeah, you have pink frilly things that was probably the remnants of what Janet and Marshall had for their original decor. And then the rest is random stuff she dragged up from the basement or garage to try and make it her own. She didn't want pink walls, and, you know, Marshall and Janet were too busy doing something, so she sloppily puts up black checkerboards on the wall and calls it a day. Right. And also there's this sort of uh, fun uh, quality to how um, she's she's always... It's personal. When she... When she has a reference or even slang, some of her slang, we weren't using always, you know, we used the 411, which was the one common one of the moment, but mostly she made up her own slang. It was something I realized is that if you use the slang they're using in the moment, then you're dated. But if the character makes up their preferences, so they make up their preferences for Dan Quayle or for, you know, these other things that she's talking about, even if it's Jackie O, it's because she knows something about it and it makes it contemporary because it's character based. And that was what I think made it not just a dated thing, but something that's still about that character when you watch it now. Yeah, even 30 years on, the show doesn't really feel dated in the traditional sense. It's clear that you weren't 50s and 60s kids in the writer's room so putting references to stuff you liked in your childhood or trying to right. grasp onto what was current. Her likes were even outdated then, and as a result, they're kind of less outdated in retrospect. Right, right, right. If she were to just be constantly going on about new kids on the block, Joey Lawrence, and so forth and so on, that would be a little bit more dated than her just randomly picking out, you know, liking they might be giants and whatnot. Continuing on to the look and feel of the show that kind of does date it, but in the best way possible, are the video games and on-screen graphics. So what was the process in creating those games and graphics and implementing them into the show so seamlessly? Yeah, it was that way from the beginning. It was, all, it was my idea that she was giving the news. And the news in those days had these graphics. You know, they had news flash. And then... If she's going to give the news and she's going to have news like graphics when she does it, then she um, has it has to be made as if she made it herself. And um, so there was a lot of discussion on we got a very good graphic artist, obviously, to create these graphics, but he had to do them as if it was Clarissa making them and they weren't just perfect or something. You know, we gave it a motif, we gave it some some direction. And so that was very playful. The video games were, were actually done, the, the graphics were done by a guy named Don St. Mars, who was brilliant. And the video games were done by this very uh, creative Canadian writer, Tim Burns, who made the video games. And that actually leapfrogged so far, really, that it's almost like now. I mean, because when did people start to actually make their own video games? You know, it's only very recently, you know, there was all that, there was the idea of doing it then, so yeah, all of that was to make her as contemporary and forward looking and playful and visual as possible, you know? So it wasn't, look, the other thing I was trying to do in Clarissa that had nothing to do with teens and Nickelodeon 
was that I hated sitcoms. Sitcoms were so slow. Mary Tyler Moore, as brilliant as a sitcom as it was, was like everything was always the same and it was always locked in and it had to, you couldn't leap around in time. Scenes to always took this amount of time and all that kind of stuff. So I wanted short scenes. I wanted graphics on the screen. I wanted crazy plots, you know, and, and to be able to have so much more fun with the idea of a sitcom than what they did at the time. And it didn't matter to me that it was a kid sitcom because honestly, they wouldn't let me do that in a sitcom. And when I tried to do Clarissa as a 18 year old on CBS and that pilot that they killed and beat to death, uh, and I got taken off of after I wrote it and did all this work on it, you know, they, they actually eliminated all the fantasies which is another aspect. It was the fantasies, the graphics, the video games. They eliminated all the fantasies and graphics and stuff. And they said, oh, audiences, adult audiences won't understand that. They won't like it. You can get away with that with kids, you know? And of course it's totally untrue. And now sitcoms have all kinds of graphics. And I mean, if you look at uh, Sherlock Holmes, the one that's done in the UK, the graphics in the first season were so many similarities to Clarissa with arrows pointing at things and circles. It's really great now. We'll obviously get into the failed pilot in a little bit, but yeah, I can't imagine the thought process in stripping those away because then you kind of just have a regular sitcom starring Melissa Joan Hart. It no longer feels like Clarissa. Also, side note, I'm still not over Nickelodeon never doing a time video game for the show. Hell, they could have just made a bunch of mini games and reused the assets they already had. Come on, Nick. Put it in the Nick box. I know. We worked on, you know, that was the dawn of the, um, that was the beginning of uh, merchandise based on TV shows. Instead of, you know, there was this period where they had toys that they made TV shows from. But it wasn't until Ren and Stimpy that Nickelodeon really understood that you could merchandise the hell out of a show that's successful. And Clarissa, they didn't even do clothes. They didn't do anything from Clarissa besides the board game, which was enormously <laughs> successful. So yeah, I worked on a video game. It was fun, but it never saw the light of day. Yeah, it's a little weird in retrospect that they didn't try and do more of the show when it came to merchandising. I mean, I know it didn't have the crazy set pieces like the Nicktoons did, so that takes out a lot of the toy elements. But I don't know, like you said, a clothing line for girls or a doll that has all the outfits with it or again a video game on the other hand on the other hand it existed in a pure a pretty pure state meaning it's you know it was a pretty clean show that that was what it was supposed to be and it wasn't just about merchandise by any means while the show did have a lot of goofy moments that stretch past the typical suspension of disbelief the episode Ferguson explains all from season five goes way off the deep end. There's time travel. We'll go back to prehistoric time and see the original Jurassic Park. Dad, I don't even like dinosaurs. Yes, well, it's too late now to back out. The corn was about to go. Uh... Wow. Mind control, Sam's turned into a monkey at one point. Ferguson, stop! I, I, I. <laughs> and while it's all revealed to be a dream, it does kind of stand out. So was this a screw it? The show's almost done. Let's do whatever we want. Moment or what? Yeah, there was a Ferguson explains it all episode that I really actually was hoping they'd spin off into some crazy Ferguson series. And I was doing it because I knew the, 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 the series was coming to a close and I really wanted Jason to have some kind of show that he could do after it was over. Because it was really a bit, you know, it was a weird dynamic for the actors, the way the show ended, because the show it's not like now where as soon as a show goes on, there's social media, right? It was, the show was completely over when it became a hit, meaning that everybody was done shooting, they went home. They didn't know how successful they were. 
until uh, the show they left they left Florida and they left the show and the show was airing regularly. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? It was really strange for them. So to to Sean, for instance, the guy that played Sam, he was like, okay, I guess I don't have a career. You know, my big show's over. He had no idea. You know, to Jason and Melissa, obviously, was more from a you know ingrained showbiz you know drive. But for everybody else, it was a bit kind of a, a strangeness of being so successful, but not being in the show. And then they wouldn't do more. So it was just really tough on the actors, you know, um, I felt. But so one of the things I wanted to do is I wanted, I tried to do was to give Jason a potential spinoff, which was, you know, the Time Machine episode. And I just thought it was so wacky and so much fun and so easy to do, even though we had limited budget. And, you know, they did some shows on Nickelodeon a little bit like that feel later on. Like, I forget, there was a time travel, there was some time uh, sitcom, I forget on Nick, not long after that. Um, but anyway, you know, yeah, we, we, we definitely, you know what we wanted to do? You know, when you have a sitcom, you wanna go do the weird things that you wanna get to do. You've got these characters, you've been, you know them so well, you've done all the normal episodes, you've done a good job of every week exploring their characters. Well, before you end, you want to do something that's just fun and you want to do these things that what if Clarissa did this, you know? It's funny, I read a fan, I read fan fiction every once in a while and there was a fan fiction version of Clarissa where she's a superhero and Clarissa is her uh, secret identity, I guess. It was really good. I was like, wow, Clarissa could kind of be, you know, a superhero. That could have happened, you know? And then when, even when I wrote my novel, I wrote a novel called Things I Can't Explain years and years later, um, based on Clarissa with her at 26, I felt like, oh, am I writing fan fiction at this moment or something? What am I writing, you know? So, I, you know, I just think you wanted to see is look, I've wanted them, the characters to live forever. I think they're so much fun and there's so many things you can do with them. Um, so, you know, to me, it was time to do the fun stuff. Yeah, I think a Ferguson Center spinoff could really have worked. That episode did allow Jason to take center stage and he was good at it. Years later, we would see a semi-successful attempt at giving the annoying younger brother a spinoff with Corey in the house, which was spun off from That's So Raven. So it could have worked. I do think it's telling that of the four VHS tapes the show got back in the day, two of them were Ferguson-centric with Take My Brother, Please, and the titular Ferguson Explains It All. So Nickelodeon had at least confidence in the idea that making so many Ferguson-centric episodes represent such a high percentage of the home video market would work. Side note, the tapes are pretty cool because unlike other Nickelodeon tapes in the era, they actually had wraparound segments that were filmed just for the tapes, which were a lot of fun. Click the link below to see them. They were pretty fun. Well, speaking of failed spinoffs, we did touch on it earlier, but I think it's a good time to now discuss Clarissa now in depth. So how did this work? Did they approach you with the idea or was it the other way around? Was Clarissa taken off the air to do this or was this an idea in response to it going off the air? Oh, no, no. I... I was, I was not, I mean, I didn't want the show to end. I felt the characters could keep growing. People were still engaged with, with Clarissa for sure. And um, she was getting more and more sophisticated. And I, I pitched the idea and cast it with uh, Robert Klein and Marion Seldes. And I built the sets for the new version. And I wrote something like a dozen drafts of the script and it would have been great, but they cut up, cut me off at the knees. I mean, they came in and one day and said, we're replacing you as a writer. Uh, we're cutting all the fantasies. We're cutting all the graphics. We're cutting all the cool stuff that it were, you know, it was the next generation of all that stuff, the next level of all that. And so you did have that thing that you just talked about, right? If you get rid of all that stuff, you've got pretty much a straight sitcom. You don't have the special quality of the original thing. And Melissa 
Look, one of the reasons that Melissa is so great with all those different aspects going on is that she's so normal and natural at that time. Like she doesn't go, oh my God, here's a fantasy. You know what I mean? She's just, oh yeah, I remember that day. She doesn't, you know, she, her coolness and relaxed and light touch allows all the graphics and all that stuff to work super well. She doesn't get rattled by it at all. And so, but once you take all that stuff away, now you're competing with people with Clarissa tied, hands tied behind its back. You know, it's just ridiculous, you know? So I hated it when they aired it because they weren't supposed to air it. And I, I hated it when they would go on and on about how, well, this proves that Clarissa couldn't happen in prime time, which is a very showbiz way of looking at something. You know, when you go in and you take the, the original creator and producer and all the original qualities out of something and say, oh, see, that proves it doesn't work. So uh, probably hates too strong a word, disappointment's better. And uh, that's the way it went, you know, but, you know, we'll see over time, I think people will understand. So now you were able to come back to the world of Clarissa in 2015 with your book titled Things I Can't Explain. So over 20 years removed from the show's original run, and now smack dab in the middle of 90s nostalgia boom with Nickelodeon launching the Splat and the 90s All That blocks. Did those inspire you to take a more grown-up look at Clarissa, or was this something you had always been tinkering with over the years? Oh, I wanted to come back forever. So when she... I just thought, look, when you're 14, like she was in the series, uh, especially a girl in those days, I think it's still true to some degree, maybe even younger, they kind of have everything figured out and nothing can touch them. They're, they, there's nothing they can fail at, really. They're very, I mean, I'm not saying every kid is happy at 14. I'm saying girls tend to know what they're doing and how they're dressing and how they're, you know, and these days, especially because it's been uh, so great for young women to be enabled to do what they want to do as opposed to the old days. In fact, I think guys have it harder than girls now. Girls at one time weren't given confidence and the right to do stuff enough. Now guys have their own set of uh, hangups uh, that need to be addressed, but that's a whole nother story. But I wanted to see the difference between your, what you're like if you're a successful kid like Clarissa at 14 and 26 is that nothing goes right at 26. The world is upside down at 26 and the world was upside down, you know, when I wrote that. Um, and it still is upside down, right? So, you know, she goes from being never, she was kind of like Bugs Bunny in the sense that nothing ever, she never failed, she never lost. She always won, she always had another plan. And that strategy always worked. Uh, but when you get to be older, you hit the wall, things happen to you. And I wanted the opportunity to do that and to play with that and see how she would survive that. And also I wanted to have fun with the characters where they'd be now. Ferguson is totally whacked out in that. He's like insider trading and spying for the American government as a double agent with the Russians. I mean, I just took Ferguson out as far as I could, you know, and the parents are worried about their relationship um and you know janet may go off on her own she sold tofu glue to the chinese you know so there was still the broad crazy sitcom quality stuff and you know and clarissa was trying to make the best of trying to be a writer and a journalist and uh and i wanted to see her have a romance you know which in this case included sam so you know, it was really fun and you got to learn what happened to Elvis. You got to learn, you know, have a kind of little, there's every little thing in the, in the series was touched on in the book. So it was a lot of fun. So this segues nicely into the next topic. A proposed sequel series has been in the work for a while now. A comparison I've heard from fans is that it might be like Girl Meets World, where the original Boy Meets World cast was involved more so than the parents were in the original show but they were solidly secondary characters. Would that be the case, or would this just be an aged up version of what we saw in the 90s, but now with the ensemble around Clarissa, including her kids, Ferguson's kids, coworkers, and a spouse? Well, we'll have to see. <laughs> I mean, I'm hopeful that we will, that something will happen, but I think the configuration is, we've tried many configurations. I've written 
a number of possibilities and um, it would be great for it to come back in any form. There's any number of possibilities and I'm still hopeful that it'll come, that it'll be something new. And, but we'll have to wait and see what happens. Well, now's the time to be doing it because, you know, you have Paramount Plus. You know, the iCarly sequel series seems to be doing well. So, come on, fingers crossed. I'd subscribe. Yeah, you know, there's no doubt. There's, it's a driver for audiences. It would be a driver for audiences to see it. And it's interesting what millennials may, you know, millennials may prefer to see, you know, um, to not see. I, I think iCarly did well, but, but I think sometimes millennials want to see something new, too. So, we'll see what happens, you know. Now, there is one, not lost per se, more so forgotten pieces of media with Clarissa out there. The theme song is obviously iconic, but scholars have been wondering for years the true meaning behind it. What does Nana mean? Well, luckily, as the show was wrapping up, an inner universe band called Clarissa and the Straight Jackets released their one and only album titled This Is What Nana Means. There is Right, which is what? I still don't know. But yeah, it, at least we have a song called This Is What Na Na Means. So considering the fact that the show was never really music-centric in the sense like Hannah Montana, The Monkees, Naked Brothers Band, etc., where it was about a bunch of musicians and it was kind of created to sell real-world records. So how did this incredibly odd piece of pop culture come into existence? Well, it's weird because, you know, it's not that unusual to do now a record based on a successful series. I had proposed it and the original record was very grunge. It was very Nirvana and Pearl Jam and all that kind of stuff. And it was straight ahead. And the music is really Rachel, Rachel Sweet. And she had a partner, uh, Tony, I, I don't recall his last name right now, another brilliant musician. They were real rock musicians and they wrote everything and produced it. And I produced it with them and, and Melissa sang in it. And it was so good that they got worried about releasing it because they said, oh, this is like a regular rock and roll album. We should only be doing something for kids. And so they, they dumbed it down. They took, they reduced the length of the song cuts from six minutes to three. They put in the goofy stuff in between. It, it was a shame because we were ahead of everybody in terms of, you know, the actress singing and, and being a musician, you know, and, you know, like obviously Miley Cyrus and so many other people. So, it, you know, again, it was another idea that was ahead of its time and they, you know, the, the original show, they were taken by surprise. I've done a couple of shows where people just let me do what I want to do because they're not like overthinking it. Like Bear in the Big Blue House was one and Clarissa was one. And, um, and I got a free run to just go as far as I possibly could to create something great. And they both turned out really well. But what happens eventually is everybody gathers around in the committees and everybody starts thinking about it and overthinking about it. And that's when ideas like, oh, I don't know if he could climb up the ladder. I mean, that might be dangerous. Kids will be climbing up the ladder, you know? And then you don't get to do so many wonderful things. So they kind of overthought the music. They overthought, you know, the, the CBS pilot. What are you gonna do? I'm, I'm always grateful when I have a shot to do something original and they let me do that. And then I do my best to keep doing things original, you know, and, and see what happens. I actually do unironically really like the album, even with it being slightly compromised. I mean, the, this is what Nana -Nah means. It's a very catchy remix of the iconic theme song. Also, I do have to say, I now have the theme song stuck in my head, so that's great. But also, this show ties with Batman from the 60s for having the catchiest theme song that largely relies on just the words na-na over and over again. That's 
pretty good. It is a really great theme song. I adore it. On the topic of the theme song, Clarissa is one of the very few shows that on repeat viewings, I never skip the theme song. It's the perfect length. The lyrics are so simple, but bouncy and energetic. And above all, it is catchy. Good luck trying to get this out of your head for like a week after listening to this interview. I know I can't. The visuals are just great too, because it just shows you what type of character Clarissa is. She's just in charge of it all. She writes her name back. That was like something I came up with. We were in a garage shooting that in New York. And I had to come up with it in like about a half hour. And I came up with her writing her name backwards. So it was so much fun. I think that, that, that part is so cool. And again, she's so relaxed that she can go da 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 and da and you think and you buy it, you know. Yeah, I love when she writes it backwards. And I have to give her a lot of credit there because even though it's a little off mode. model from what the logo is when she spins it around she did a pretty damn good job on it especially since she had to do it backwards a lot better than i probably would have yeah one of my favorite things is when people have taken those old disney channel bumpers where the stars would plug their shows and then draw the mickey logo but you can see in a lot of them they're nowhere near even close to getting the mickey mouse logo correct so again points for melissa for getting it so close Hey, I'm Hilary Duff from Lizzie McGuire, and you're watching Disney Channel. <laughs> now, as iconic as the intro is, there was an alternate version for the first season that's rarely seen now. Can you shed light on that? The original opening was her wearing various costumes that everybody wanted her to wear. And that was very much her... Um, it was very much trying to create a, a girl who wasn't what everybody thought she was, that she could be anything. And it was a very important opening actually for boys liking the show because there's this one point where she's bouncing the basketball and shooting. And I remember when we were shooting it that she didn't play basketball. <laughs> and so, it didn't look like she knew how to play basketball. And I thought, oh my God, if we let that be on the air, there's not one boy that's gonna watch this show. So I cut it into jump cuts. So it looked like she knew what she was doing and you couldn't tell, right? And, but meanwhile, I was really trying to hit every stereotype of girls and kids and a monster and a ballerina and a this and a that, that might, you know, trigger um, you know, affection for the character. So that was the first opening, the original opening. And then later we decided we wanted something more sophisticated because she was getting a bit older. And that's when we shot the uh, spinning logo in the spinning name in the, in the uh, logo in the, in the garage. So now to wrap up, the show is now 30 years old. Looking back on its creation, its popularity, failed spinoffs, a book sequel, and a potential revival, how do you feel about it in its entirety and its legacy overall? Well, here's the thing. People, I have the most wonderful experience, which is that when I talk to people, your age, some older, some younger, and they find out that I did Clarissa. Bear too, by the way, a slightly younger crowd has the same reaction about Bear. And, you know, I worked on Rugrats, Ren and Stimpy and Doug and all these other shows, but Clarissa in particular, without male, female, black, white, Asian, gay, straight, trans, I've had every kind of person say to me, oh my God, you made my childhood. Like as if somebody sent out a script to everybody saying, that's the thing that you should say. That's not the same as like, oh, I remember that show. Oh yeah, there was that show. Yeah, was that the show? They don't do that. They go, oh my God, you made my childhood. Or I had a woman um, who had tattoos all over the place and spiky hair say, did you realize when you created Clarissa that you would create me, you know? And it just is about the most satisfying thing I can think you'd ever want is the idea that you created something that everybody can use. I mean, I wish we had more uh, diversity in the original show. I'm slightly, you know, I'm somewhat 
you know, disturbed by it. I wasn't, I mean, Italian was considered diversity in those days. Do you know what I mean? And it really should have had, you know, a black friend and it should have had more going on, but it was for its time, it was pretty good. And, um, but there's nothing stopping anybody from identifying with Clarissa. And, and that has been just deeply satisfying. You couldn't want to have created anything better than something that everybody can watch. And when I watch it now, you know, I mean, there's some episodes that aren't as good as I'd like them to be, but by and large, the first six episodes, they're still pretty good on their own and they're funny, you know, and I love her and they're, they're just still different. So it's, it's just a very satisfying thing. The phrase, explains it all, you know, you can have, you know, Condé Nast explains it all. I mean, everybody explains it all now, you know, in the title, it's like the Twilight Zone. So if, if you're a writer and you create something that becomes iconic, that people use as a reference point in every generation, it's pretty satisfying. Yeah, I mean, I honestly can't tell you how many times I've heard da 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 da, -da explains it all. It's also become a kind of a punchline. When I asked around on the 90s subreddit if people had questions about the show, most of them were variations of, why didn't she explain this? But that wasn't really the point of the show. You wrote Clarissa to be a strong-willed character who thought she had everything figured out and thus carried herself as if she had everything figured out. So she had a lot of confidence, which for kids like me, that was an important thing to try and pick up. Clarissa was confident, so I tried to be more confident by being like her. She was a role model for a lot of kids. This was a very tightly and well-written, not just kids show, but a show in general. I do have to say there were so many good writers on the show, as much as I did write a lot. You know, the, the woman that wrote Hunger Games wrote on the show. Uh, Alan Goodman, Alexa Young was a main writer for Friends and has created a bunch of new shows. And Doug Petrie did Daredevil and stuff like that. You know, you know Patty Marks writes for The New Yorker. I mean, if you look at the people who wrote on that show, they're like amazing writers, you know? And um, I don't really deserve any credit for what came after, but they really wrote some really cool stuff, you know, for that series. You know, I think we'll leave it on that note. Um, again, thank you for coming on by talking with us. It was a lot of fun hearing about all the behind the scenes secrets, all the not so fun behind the scenes secrets, and the potential future for Clarissa Explains All. Again, if you want to check out Mitchell's book, Things I Can't Explain, the link will be down below. So again, Mitchell, thank you for stopping by, and you know we hope to see you again soon. Thanks so much. Well, until next time, I hope everyone out there has a good rest of your day. Now